chair or do you buy a $400 chair? Do you buy 10 of them? Do you buy, you know, three of them? You know, 10 $300 decisions is 3000 bucks. A hundred of them is $30,000 in your budget. And there's almost no vendor that you can go to that when he gives you his best price and you say, look, I need another 300 bucks off, they won't, they'll, they'll give it to you. And sometimes, you know, I just say, listen, don't ask. I know it's a great price, but I have this superstition. I need 300 bucks more off. And 99% of the time you get it. And, and then you've built yourself a, a cushion. You've built yourself uh, a way to get back to a budget if you were over it. You built yourself space to, to work within it. Again, more light. I mean, even my lighting has texture on it. You design a set twice, once for the camera and once for the guy paying for everything. Um, you know, I, I start by designing a set really <clears throat> thinking about what the, what the camera shots are, and those are the important things. But that takes place, say, here, if I'm the guy speaking. Maybe a reverse shot to you guys to see that you're falling asleep in the middle of this. Uh, you know, a cut to the screen. Those are the key shots in this lecture. But when a guy walks in the room and he says, okay, great, that's a, you designed a little piece of set here, you made a picture frame there, and you didn't do anything for the audience, he feels like you've thrown his money away. So you design a set for the big perception, you design a set for the camera shots. When, when my client walks in, he walks up to his MasterChef logo, and he sees that it's made out of polished aluminum instead of you know, a painted piece of uh, foam core. He feels good about what he's done. He's picked the right guy. He's created a great looking environment. Design it twice. This was a music show. And again, same, same elements. You can see it in every piece. It, it almost feels repetitive. <laughs> And a lot of these surfaces will manufacture. You know, this wavy texture, this is just a set of louvers. This wavy texture, we just cut it on a, out of, uh, you know, two inch thick foam, uh, you know, on a CNC. <clears throat> Nothing is impossible. And Kent can tell you a little bit more about this. Uh, this is a kid's survivor show called Endurance. We did it for about seven seasons. Uh, Yes, it's floating on the Sea of Cortez outside of La Paz, Mexico. It was one of those brilliant ideas that your producers come up with and then you've got to figure out how to do it. Um, there was, you know, this thing is 25 feet tall, 60 feet by about 80 feet. I have no idea how, uh, how we were going to make it float. We just got a lot of flotation foam, some truss to make a base, and, um, and went for it. Uh, maybe we got lucky, maybe it was a little bit of skill, but again, nothing is impossible. Now, that brings up number eight. When something becomes impossible, find another possibility. Mr. McFan put this show on a cliff in Catalina. Same show with the temple. This was the, the huts where the kids lived. The temple was on a, on a cliff up to the left or the right. Uh, we had this great idea, how do we land, a, how do we get a, a, a set onto this island? We found a guy with a World War II landing craft. And we thought, brilliant, we're going to drive this giant boat right up onto the beach, drop its uh, loading dock, and we're going to take all this scenery off right where we need it. I'd be, I'd be standing in the water if, uh, if this thing was real. Um, what could be better? Well, we loaded up his uh, landing craft headed out there. When he gets to the beach, he decides there's no way he can land it. The waves are too big. He's not going to try. Forget it. We've got a boat full of scenery and no way to get it where it's got to go. The closest, you know, landing spot is a boat dock at UCLA's, you know, little harbor not far away. Well, Kent starts looking for options. And what does he find? The only thing that can get down this little winding road is a four-wheel drive trash truck effectively. It's a dumpster pickup. So he cross-loaded everything from our barge into 40-yard dumpsters, hoisted them onto this truck, 
drove them an hour plus down this little tiny road, offloaded the dumpster, went back to get another. There's always another possibility. And this show embodies that, that philosophy again and again and again. It's really one of the most amazing things. These are the huts uh, for the High Sierra, 20 feet in the air, built in the pine trees. Again, how are you going to do that? Well, you figure it out. You roll over a couple of... There are many ways to achieve the same thing. You just have to take a chance and try the less familiar. This was uh, endurance in um, uh, Tehachapi, and it was sort of a Wild West thing, so log huts made a lot of sense. When we designed the log huts, we bid them with scenic shops, and they were about $40,000 a piece. No way I can do that for a kid's show. So I started thinking, well, they're guys who make real log huts for a living. And we found a guy out in, I don't know where it was, you know, Wisconsin, North Dakota, someplace, who was willing to do it. And I called him up and I said, you know what? Give me your worst lumber. I want the lumber that you thought you would never be able to sell to anybody. Clear out your crap, send it to me, cut it out, make it into these huts. The cost for both of them was 14,000 bucks. I mean, it, not only was it real, and, the, and all we had to do was assemble them, but, but it was you know, a, an order of magnitude less than what it would have cost to have a set shop do it, thinking outside of the box. What other choices do I have? These guys were happy to get rid of their lousy lumber. I was happy to not have to scenic it. Well, we'd scenic it anyway, but... Um, <clears throat> Game show marathon. Again, more of you know, the same, same techniques. This texture, we build models, both computer and physical. This was a texture that was on a piece of paper that I actually used in the model. And I liked it in the model, so we just replicated it at you know, several hundred times the size and enhanced it a little bit with perforated uh, openings. You don't have to do literal texture with technology today. This is a giant printout. It's about 70 feet across. You can print that out. You can project that. Projecting it would be more expensive than printing it. But it, it works almost as well as the real thing does. You just don't get as much of a shadow or a changing shadow if you move the lights. So this next pair of sets is actually interesting from the standpoint that the client had two shows, and they only wanted to hire a designer once. But each show had to look different, and they were on the same stage and had to use more or less the same set of parts. So this is what catchphrase came out like. Again, layers, foreground, midground, background, and even further background where these get cut out and I can have lights coming through it. That's the host's close-up background. Um, <clears throat> close enough isn't. One inch makes a difference. Uh, it, when I design stuff, it always astounds me that when I create a form and it doesn't look right, I, I change it by a little bit. And sometimes it literally is an inch this way and an inch that way. And uh, it suddenly all the pieces fall together. Um, how do we go backwards? Oh, it's not going backwards. So that set, no, it's just lagging me. That set is this set. What's the difference? It's, it's, it's the inch. The, the columns are the same. The headers are the same. I introduced a couple of different wood tones and I changed out the wavy backing for one with with holes in it. Um, not really a very big difference but a dramatic visual difference when you get down to it. Rediscovered. Uh, these days there's a lot of uh, LED and visual technology being used in music shows and this set was sort of playing with those. Um, these are giant LED screens that we can do a a video playback. And the way I arranged the set is that more or less from this view you had a complete screen around the room. Uh, but one of the requirements was I had Ricky Minor, who's now Jay Leno's band leader, 
with a band in here, and he insisted on being seen from camera. But I, this show wasn't about Ricky. It was about the guy singing in the middle. So I set it up so that the camera from this point anywhere to the right would always have a clean uh, you know, stage. And if you slowly swung around to the left, camera left, you started to see the band and Ricky. He felt good. The director got what he wanted. Problem solved. Um, this technology is phenomenal. Not only can you do, use it as a lighting effect, which is what you're seeing here, but I could do a video playback across the entire uh, row of pylons, uh, and you know it dramatically changes the mood. And then when you get to an up-close shot, it has a nice abstract breakdown that is completely different. I mean, you can't even tell the image. And, uh, and again, it's light and texture. Doggy dog quite some time ago now, but it illustrates a few good things. This is a massive set. Um, 40, you can see, here's a guy. This thing is 45 feet tall and, and uh, sits on a 100 by 120 foot stage, and we built the swimming pool for it, 20 feet deep. Um, it was a really tight budget, and our producers said, you know, we have this idea, we want it to be sort of like that, uh, you know, this or that, something no one's ever seen before, one of these typical lines. And, um, you know, I knew I couldn't do that, you know, on the budget and the time frame I was given. So what I had to do was create something that I could believe in, that I knew that we could get done, and then sell them the idea. And, and uh, you know, this is what we ultimately ended up with. It's, an, it's large surfaces, but again, your subject is way out here doing a stunt, and the background is so far back that you don't, uh, you don't suffer from a, a big blank space when you're up against it. Uh, only if we were playing right in front of it would it be a problem. You wind up with really, you know, quite a rich wide shot. Now all the same stuff that I've been talking about applies to, you know, sitcom sets or, or any of these kinds of, you know, reality sort of environments. I mean, Take a look at this one. There's multiple doors going to other places. I've even put a mirror on the wall that reflects something even further back that implies that this is much bigger set than what it is. Uh, this is really a, a, a three-wall set. Um, you know, we work in practicals and, and uh, lighting that, that um, adds to the reality and makes it believable that the space is lit from itself rather than just uh, by a lighting designer. You know, this is where it looks bare bones. But even this simple set has multiple entrances. There's a doorway here, there's a doorway there, there's another behind the, the hutch, windows, second stairs. You're creating opportunity for um, the actors. You're creating a believability uh, with these sets. And, you know, even in reality, now this is a scripted set, so I generally know what the action's going to be. I know that I need a living room. I know I need X number of entrances. In reality sets, you don't have a script, but the set then becomes even more important from the standpoint that you can create activity. Like when I do a set where we live at, like at Hell's Kitchen or uh, For Love or Money, you know, when you put a twin bed in next to a queen bed, well, suddenly there's a little bit of strife between those cast members. Well, who's going to get the queen? I want the queen. Well, that's the stuff that generates story in TV shows in reality shows anyway. And the set can do that. Um, this is um, the man show. Again, it's a pretty ordinary, you know, diner type setting. But then there's a window line, there's a back hallway, and beyond that is Las Vegas. Uh, there's three layers to one, to one simple background. The correct first response to any absurd request is, sure, no problem, right away. Um, if somebody asks you to float a pyramid on the Sea of Cortez, sure, no problem, right away. Um, if somebody at the man show, say, Jimmy Kimmel says, you know, the proper way to dispense beer would be through the breasts of Venus, sure, no problem, right away. And then you figure out how to make that a beer tap. Yeah, it works. I don't know if you guys have watched it. It's all on reruns now. Pull the arm, 